Hi, I'm Jay Richters, the founder and CEO of Together We Care. I started this company because I was sick and tired of seeing so many organizations out there doing the absolute wrong thing when it comes to treating their staff with dignity and respect, their clients, and also using funding in incorrect ways. And this is my story. Welcome to the Fair Business Australia podcast. Future-proof your business, impact your community. I'm your host, Rebecca Lloyd. Welcome, Fair Business Australians, to a brand new episode of the Fair Business Australian podcast. I have with me Jay Richter, who is an old friend, actually. We met a few years ago at a networking event, and I've asked him if he would come on to our podcast today to share about his business, to share about his passion, to share his story with you. And welcome, Jay. Fantastic to have you today. Thanks for coming on. Hello. Hello. Thank you so very much for having me. It's uh, it's an honour. Yeah, so I see that you are NDIS. I can see that from your background banners and I'm seeing some gorgeous elderly people there. So do you work in an old folks home? Like what? what's the story there behind that? Yeah, sure. So uh, we provide in-home support services to people to help them stay safe and independent in their own homes, um, whether that be age care or disability. We we service both um, both sides of the sector in care. And um, yeah, we're just all about, you know, raising the bar as well in in the care sector because uh, for too long there's just been, I guess, substandard care going out into the community and, and it's time for that to change. It's, it's time for people to get treated with dignity and respect and look after them and also their families as well because it's so important. Yeah, the three words that really stuck out to me there were substandard, dignity and respect and those are very much opposite ends of the spectrum there. And I know that there will be a bunch of people, as soon as they saw NDIS, they'll have gone, oh, because they'll have had a bad experience. I know people personally who have had bad experiences with NDIS. So for people who are watching this Zoom now, um, why are you any different to any other NDIS provider? Why would we expect a good story to come out of your services? Let's start with pain points, yeah, because everybody loves to have a wine. So tell me some pain points and how you came in and actually overcame what you were encountering. Absolutely. A lot of the pain points people were coming and telling me were they couldn't get a hold of their coordinator. Their coordinator didn't know what they were doing. Um, The fees and charges were just astronomical. Things were getting charged that weren't correct for, um, you know, they weren't correct items for the NDIS. Mm. Um, And then on the aged care side as well, it's um, these massive companies out there are just signing up clients and basically cancelling their services without even providing them with explanations, but still charging them. Um, so there's a lot of really unethical behaviour that's going on out there in the care industry, both in aged care and also in NDIS. Mm. And, you know, we've absolutely had enough of it. We want to make a change and we're standing up for um, these poor, vulnerable people in our community that need a, a, a provider to genuinely care and to, and and look after these people and mm. have none of that absolute nonsense going on because it's just it's time for it. It's time for a revolution. It's time for a change, and it really is time for people to get what they deserve and be treated with absolute dignity and respect. Because at the end of the day, some of the stories that I've heard as well have absolutely broken my heart, and I just I just can't stand it. So. I, um, you know, worked for a number of organisations over a long period of time and just saw some just disgusting behaviour, you know, um, nepotism within organisations, misappropriation of government funding, um, just terrible things that should never, ever happen. And the person that suffers is the is the consumer and that's just, it, it just has to stop. So, you know, I set up shop a number of years ago and, you um, you know, the reason we're in this business is to care. It's not about money. It's not about, you know, taking everything for, you know, for granted. I mean, obviously it's a business that needs to make a little bit of profit and it needs to be able to, you know, support itself. And we do a really good job of that by taking care of our support team. Um, But yeah, things really need a shake up in this industry. And um, I've taken that on as my purpose and mission in life and um you know i'm going to see this through right to the very end because i've had enough of um of the absolute garbage that goes on in the care sector it's time it's time for change Mm. now one of the things that um i found really interesting that you just said i mean obviously folks taxpayer dollars pay for the government pay for the services in theory for what we need but but one of the things that um stuck out to me during what you said was 
um, astronomical fees, but I can't get a hold of my service provider. So, so where is the money going? Because we all need to work, we all need to pay our tax, otherwise the country would crumble. And yet it seems to me that there is a disconnect between us paying our tax and the tax going to the services that are for our most needy and vulnerable. So what do you have to say to that? And the second part of that, I know people love stories, so I'm wondering, obviously, keeping, you know, no names, but are you able to share some of those stories so that we can hear specific examples as to how you have specifically come in and fixed those astronomical fees, fixed those, um, I'm not allowed to choose my own service provider because that's a lot of stuff that happens during COVID and got really, really great results to that. So money and then some specific examples. One example that really sticks out in my mind is um, uh, a very elderly gentleman, 97 he was. Um, he and his wife were both on home care packages, so this is the aged care story, um, and they had enormous amounts of unspent funds. Like I'm talking $70,000 in unspent funds. Um, this gentleman was getting three showers a week. That's it. <gasps> That was all no. he was getting. No nursing care. Um, they requested to get um, a lifter chair to help him get in and out of his chair. Um, just it absolutely devastated me when I heard this story because this poor man, I mean, his home care package was around 50000 a year. So that's a whole entire year of unmet need, which borderlines complete and utter neglect as far as I'm concerned. Um, and once we signed them up, we went through a really strong education around what your funding could be used for. And in the end, this man was receiving about 20 hours of support from us per week, whereas he was getting three hours beforehand. Um, we were looking after his lawn and maintenance, um, his clinical need, transport needs, um, had OT assessments going. He received regular physiotherapy, podiatry, like all of these services were services that should have been provided by that previous um, company and there was just nothing. And um, he'd been signed up with them for four years. He met the coordinator on the first sign-up meeting and never, ever, ever saw that person again. Um, and they're supposed to have six monthly reviews at minimum. Um, and this person was with that organisation for four years and never, never heard from that coordinator again. Um, only when they would pick up the phone and call the coordinator to ask for things and then were told, oh, sorry, um, there's not enough funding or that's not a a, a clinical need for, for you to use that funding. And so the wow. way the funding was working is that the government puts that money into the company's trust account. And so you can imagine these providers are loving sitting on these huge balances of people that are not having their needs met because mm. they're cashing in on, you know, interest and ability to, you know, scale and get really large, massive loans to go out and create other programs to then do exactly the same thing again. Mm. And it, 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 like, it literally breaks my heart. Like, I just, I cannot believe that there are people in this world that are that unethical and and behaving in this manner when this poor man was at the end of his life and all he needed was services put in place and you know we've had him for around about a year now um his bank his balance has gotten down to around about the 25,000 mark and i mean we are putting in every service we possibly can um and supporting his beautiful wife as well to make sure she's um you know taken care of um, providing respite opportunities. She's 90 herself. So she's been um, his full-time carer for the last, say, 20 years. And, um, you know, this poor woman was broken when we signed them up because she had not had any respite for that whole entire four years. So we were able to put in support staff for a number of days for this poor woman to go and actually have a break from being a carer and, you know, and and take, take a breather. Um and the outcome of this has just been absolutely phenomenal. You know, both of their health and wellness has improved to um, incredible levels where, you know, we can see these people reaching their, you know, reaching their 100th birthday. And that oh. is just such an honour to be able to, yeah. to look after someone and make sure they're getting the right thing, the right services um, and having regular contact with their support coordinator so that if anything's changing, bang, we can implement something straight away and make sure that person's getting what they deserve and what they most most likely need as well. Wow, so good. So good. We'll go to another story in a moment, folks. But, Jay, I, I want to 
uh, rest on those two things that you told me. Um, $75,000 worth of unmet needs. Um, he, he only heard from the coordinator when he picked up the phone to ring them. Now, is this genuinely a coordinator issue or is this an admin issue? And the reason why I'm asking that, folks, is because I want to segue into Jay keeps talking about we and us, and I'm going to get him to share his story around that because that is actually quite fascinating. And I saw Jay doing this two years ago. I've actually known Jay for at least two, three years. So I've personally watched him grow this business out of a passion. So, so is that an administrative issue? Is it an individual uh, coordinator issue? Like where is the, where's the disconnect there? Yeah, absolutely. So I believe it's a systemic issue with regards to care and how it's being provided to begin. Mm. So um, I like to follow the trail of what's gone on in that specific situation. So I was actually able to, um, to have a conversation with that previous support coordinator and find out what was going on. And her response to me was that senior management were basically putting pressure on her uh, not to spend the consumer's funding because it was a benefit to the organisation. So that's... Oh, but, 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 but. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you can't just continue talking from that. So <laughs> the organisation wanted to keep the money and she wanted to help and they wouldn't let her. Is that what you've just said to us? Absolutely, 100%. At just disgusting. Absolutely putrid. And this is a systemic issue. It's not just that organisation. Um, for instance, I used to work for one of the largest employers in Queensland, other than the state government, not-for-profit organisation, has the highest level of fees and provides the lowest quality of care. And then also within the office, it's an absolute toxic work environment. I lasted six months before I had a breakdown and had to leave. And I then went to another organisation um, and, you know, misappropriation of government funding was occurring there as well. Um, they had a community visitor scheme that was funded by government providing visitor scheme, um, so providing volunteer visitors to go and, you know, reduce isolation for people. My uh, senior manager came in and told me, you know, before the funding was about to get re reapplied for, Jay, we haven't we haven't um, fulfilled our need. You're going to need to forge visits in the system <gasps> so that we can turn around and apply for the funding. Because if we haven't used lot, we haven't used it. We're not going to get this next round of funding. And I absolutely bro it broke my heart. I refused to do it, and I actually quit that job. And that's when I went out on the, my own, and I went, you know what? This the time has come. Enough is enough. We need good, honest people working in this sector because the standard of care is substandard and there is just so much disgusting, you know, just such disgusting behaviour occurring within the whole sector. And mm -hmm. there are other really great providers out there. I'm not going to bag all of them. Um, there are some really good providers out there. But you know what? They Some of these bad ones do a really good job of hiding what exactly is going on. And it's just, it's devastating. Mm -hmm. Folks, when people become commodities, that's when a society crumbles. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now let's go to talking about we and us. Now, Jay, I know that there are a lot of coordinators out there that really, really, really want to do the right thing and to a large degree their hands are tied. And I, I know this because, I mean, not coordinators, service providers. I had a lot of service providers actually ring me during COVID because they had been fired, no jab, no job. This is not that Zoom. That's a different um, kettle of fish. But I know that you started your business ramping up during COVID to help uh, service providers who really wanted to be able to provide more support but had their hands tied administratively or sinisterly, whatever you want to go with. So so what does that look like when you say we, us, how do you actually help uh, service providers to provide service, which is their job, ladies and gentlemen, but, you know. Yeah, so I guess uh, my philosophy is um, that saying, you know, the tide rises all boats. So if we can go out there and give a five-star service, and I'll be honest with you, 90% of our consumers leave other providers and come to us because they've heard great stories about what we do in the community. Um, after COVID, there were a lot of people that were still stuck at home, these elderly people isolated, not going out, not even going to shopping centres. Um, the fear that was drilled into these people was just beyond 
beyond words. One lady said to me, oh, my doctor told me if I get COVID, I'll die. So you can just imagine the fear. And so these people were isolated. We decided, you know what, we need to, we need to do something about this. So we created social support events. And every single um, week now, we started fortnightly, but it's weekly now, we pick people up from their homes, we take them to a central location. So it might be um, the re most recent one was at the Belvedere Hotel on the peninsula. Mm -hmm. um, and we all sat down, we all had a, an amazing meal. There's conversation, there's connections. People had run into each other that used to work together 30 years ago oh. in the same group. Um, there's exchanging of phone numbers, there's communication outside the event now. And, you know, we're really reducing the social isolation in the community, which is, um, which is a massive thing. Um, so to going back to the question, so I really feel like, you know, what Together We Care is, has got the structure and everything in place now. Um, over the last couple of years, I mean, there's been teething issues, things that have happened, but we're at a point now where, we are getting so many referrals every single week and we've got the most amazing people coming and joining our team. Um, we've got people that are leaving the nursing industry coming to work with us. We've got people that are flight attendants that are leaving the industries, bankers that are leaving the industry, call center agents with amazing customer service. Like we're, we're starting to attract a really diverse range of people that are seeing a career in the care industry and they join us, we support them to get their training done. And, you know, it, it's 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 life-changing for these people because they may have had a 21-year career and they're leaving an industry that they've been in for so long and they're coming in with so many amazing transferable skills, customer service and passion because it's a new sector, it's a new, um, it's a whole new experience for them. Um, you know, a couple of our coordinators are just probably the most amazing people I've ever met. They are so incredibly dedicated, so incredibly passionate. Um, and we, you know, together we care. That's the name. We're bringing in these people and together we are going to care and together we're going to raise the bar and get that standard of care elevated. And you know what? If all the clients leave all the other providers and we become a massive provider, my most important thing being the CEO of this company is to be consistent, is to keep our to keep our level of service right up there and to manage this growth um, and keeping our culture and our values right to the very end of this. Like that's the goal, that's the mission um, because that's the most important thing. I don't want to be the biggest, I just want to be the best. But I feel in the end, we will become one of the biggest providers in this country because we're actually doing what's right and we're for the consumer. Oh, goosebumps, literally goosebumps. I'm so excited. And this, folks, this is what happens when individuals decide to get into business because they have a passion to overcome an issue that they see in their local community. Jay, and I know, I know Jay, I've known him for years. He has gotten into this environment because he saw an issue, because he's passionate about solving. And now that we have a baby boomer generation that is growing older, I mean, what do you say to that? Like if we've got a whole bunch of taxpayer dollars um, that is diminishing because it's getting stretched across a lot more people, how do you see that being managed? I mean, that has to be through standard of care and actually loving on people because if it's just a money gain, do you think a lot of the larger providers will actually see this as just not really a worthwhile exercise when there's less taxpayer dollars? Yes, yeah, so it's quite an interesting, um, quite an interesting um, statement there because uh, I joined a group called Age Care Reform Now. Um, been a part of them for about two years, and we have some extremely strong advocates in that collective. Um, they've gone to Canberra, they've sat around a round table with senators and told them what the problems are with the aged care sector. Um, there is a big reform happening now, so we've had a royal commission into aged care. Um, and there are some massive changes coming in 2025. So uh, basically what's going to happen, they're changing the way the funding model is going to work, which is really going to affect, and this is all coming from our feedback, this is actually going to affect those providers that are doing the wrong thing because consumers, instead of banking funding up, are going to get a quarterly budget. If it's not used, it will be retracted back. And the reason they're going to do that is because right now we have a four point something billion dollar um, care industry just for aged care. 
2.2 billion of that is currently sitting unspent funds with these providers. No. So more than half of the met the the need isn't being met. So if the government, in their wisdom of listening to the feedback from these grassroots organisations, um, putting pressure on them to make a change, they're basically going to turn around and get that funding back so it can be redistributed out to more people because right now with the amount of funding that's sitting unspent, we could help twice as many people. Wow. Yes. So really what you're saying is, is that with correct management, there is always enough resources to go around. It is the mismanagement, greed and self-centeredness that means that there aren't enough resources. So baby boomers, fear not. There will be enough money for you as long as we have people like Jay at the helm. Now, I know that there are a bunch of people right now that are jumping at the bit saying, shut up, Rebecca. We just want to get in touch with Jay. So, Jay, let's have, I won't shut up just yet. Let's have two more stories and then we'll move into how people can get in touch with Jay for their nearest and dearest. Remember, it is aged care and uh, disability. So that's really, really important. So let's have a couple of stories. Then we'll move to how we can reach out to you. Sure. So um, I guess uh, oh, I'm just trying to think of another really good story for you. Um, what's what would you like to what would you like to know? Could Is we it... have um, could we have some? Could, what about? I heard a lot of stories during COVID of people who could not choose their own service providers, and they had people that they'd had for five, ten years that all of a sudden were getting kicked out because of administrative red tape. So how do you work around that for people that really want to stay with their service providers? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the most important thing is always educating. We always educate people right from the very beginning um, that you are not locked into a provider. Um, if you come and if you come and um, have a bad experience with us, we, you know, like hands down, we've had a few clients where there's been issues that have happened and they have been really great learnings for us and we have lost that client and they have moved on to a different provider. And I think that's a really important thing for providers to actually start looking at is what is the cause of the, of the consumers moving away from your service? Because you know what? We could turn around and just go, oh, you know, that person was just difficult or, or whatever, um, but if we actually, I go out and I, I went out and interviewed these people and I said, you know, did an exit formal exit interview and was like, right, what have we done wrong? How can we improve? How can we be better? We take that to our continuous improvement meeting, which we have every single month. And we turn around and discuss this as a team and go, right, what, what could we have done better in this situation to have, to have avoided that poor consumer feeling so bad about our service that they've had to go and find someone else? And 99% of the time, I've got consumers that have been with multiple providers. And what, what the problem is usually most, most of the time is there's a lack of transparency. There's no contact with the, with the coordinators and um, and they just feel like they're you know they're just taking all this money out of off of them and not actually providing something. So in both NDIS and um, aged care, you know support coordinators are paid through uh, say a percentage of of, of funding. Mm -hmm. And if you're paying that month in month out, year in year yeah. out, and you're not even seeing your coordinator or hearing from them, you shouldn't be paying for that service, and you should look for another provider because. We need to have regular contact with these people because, you know what, you can have a workforce out there and they can be seeing things that are changing. And we've got really good reporting structures where our support workers, if they notice something strange, they are straight on the phone to the coordinator and letting them know because that person's condition may be declining or they may have a new need that needs to be, that's unmet that we need to assess and then mm. so you know, it's it's super important that we are in regular contact with these customers because ultimately things can change in, in one month. And yeah. if people are not communicating with these clients, they're not learning and they're not growing and they're not able to meet that need for that person. So regular communication is absolutely key for, for the success of a care business. Folks, how many business owners or politicians do you know that will actually front up on a public Zoom that's going out to hundreds of thousands of people and say, hey, there's some in some times that we got it wrong. Not only do I admit that I got it wrong, I actually went to the client and said, 
What did we do wrong? How can we do better? That, ladies and gentlemen, is a business owner that is going places, someone that's able to humble themselves. Can you imagine if our politicians humbled themselves and said, oh, how could I have done better? The world would be in a better place, I'll tell you that much. So let's have one more story out of disability, please, and then we'll move to how we can contact you. Sure, absolutely. So um, we have a beautiful client that's from, uh, from overseas, um, from the Philippines, and um, basically she was with... She had her plan managed with one place. She had um, another service provider that was just providing her um, with a support worker. And they just, they kind of were just, it was just pretty average sort of, um, pretty average sort of care. Um, and the consumer really wanted to work with someone that had her same dialect from the Philippines because the Philippine has many different dialects. So um, we were able to specifically recruit a, Besides speaking Filipino support worker for this lady. And um, it's been an absolute match made in heaven because the two of these ladies just get on like an absolute house on fire. Um, this this woman has had some, you know, has had mental health um, issues. And so being supported with her NDIS plan and facilitating that real genuine connection, these two are like, they're almost like best friends now. Um, you know, they'll go out to lunches, um, she gets taken to her church by the support worker because they're in the same church. You know, we really do strive to always put the, the right connecting person with the participant in NDIS yeah. Yeah. Um, because it's that's so important because then you really get that like no trust um, for the support worker and then the client will really feel comfortable expressing what's going on, which then gets reported to the coordinator to then go to circle back around and go, right, we've, we've heard that this is sort of a concern of yours. What, what is it we can do, you know, to, to rectify this or to alleviate the stresses that you might be experiencing? Um, so it's all about connecting people, um, which is something you're very good at doing as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, it's very much, um, it's connecting people, the right people together so yeah. that that genuine care can happen. Because a lot of organisations have got policies like you're not supposed to touch the client, you're not allowed to give them gifts, you're not allowed to receive gifts like there's so much red tape around this and we just pulled all of that out and went you know what absolutely no if your client wants to turn around and get a hug from you go right ahead because at the end of the day that creates that that better connection so real genuine care can actually exist in the care industry because you know what i went to a consumer's house you know about a week or so ago she'd lost her husband i had a big bunch of flowers with me and she just broke down in the, at the door. And so I just held her for about five minutes while she was just absolutely bawling her eyes out. Mm -hmm. And just spending that quality time with people is just so incredibly important. Like that's a lifelong connection that we have with this lady now. Like, um, and it's, it's, it's vitally important that real true relationships and care happen within the care industry. It's not just mm. a clinical thing anymore. It needs to change. Mm. It needs How that. revolutional that care would exist within the care industry. Oh, <laughs> what an incredible idea. Talk about reinventing the wheel. <gasps> so where is your territory? Uh, what what areas do you service and how many coordinators do you have access to? Because I know people might be worried that they will run out and absolutely so the end of the line. What I've done I, in, my, in my wisdom of going, you know what, the most important thing is having that access to coordinator. We've capped the amount of clients that one coordinator is allowed to manage. So we've kept that at 40 consumers because if we, I, through my own experience, you know, I've worked for large organisations where I've had anywhere from 50 to 70. I can't know anything about my consumers or their families, their likes, their preferences. So we turned around and went, right, let's, let's look at the magic number and it's 40. So once someone hits 40 consumers, that's it. We're bang straight on to recruiting and getting a new support coordinator in the door. We've currently got multiple support coordinators that only all have a caseload of 40 consumers. And they might be a mix of NDIS and also aged care, depending on their experience and skill. And also passion. Some people just want to do NDIS. Some people just want to do aged care. So we're really flexible about, um, about how we do that. And moving forward, that's going to be the consistent structure of Together We Care because we know that during a week, you know what, if you've got 40 consumers, you've got the time to call one consumer every single day, mm -hmm. and you, or if not two consumers, and you will speak to someone at least 
once a month. Like we know that for a fact. Some consumers are very easy and they don't need any contacts, but we still call them on a monthly basis to check in with them. How are things going? Is your support worker up to standard? Is the work that you're getting done? Like we're always in this feedback loop of really finding out what it is that our consumers need and making sure we can provide that for them. So good. (laughs) Folks, you will be able to click on the link in this description to access uh, Jay's pack that he has got for you. So tell us about the pack. I'm assuming this is an educational pack. Yes, absolutely. So what we've found is that, um, you know, accessing care in this country is an absolute minefield, whether it be NDIS, whether it be aged care, it is really quite complicated. And there's so many things that are constantly changing and evolving. So we wanted to just make uh, like a downloadable PDF that people can access. And it's, you know, it's 10 pages long. It's not long. It's it's quite um, structured. So it sort of basically sets out the steps that you need to follow to turn around and access care. And um, yeah, we've simplified that and made that as, as easy as possible for people to, to get and just to kind of remove all the, the acronyms and the guff around everything that people struggle to understand and then basically put this whole thing together so someone can download it and go, right, start here, finish here, we're in. You know what I mean? Just make it easier for people. So good. Folks, you can access that PDF now by clicking on the link filling in your name and your contact details. You'll get the PDF. You'll be able to reach out to Jay. Jay, is there anything else you'd like to share with the people that are scrambling to get that PDF right now before we finish this Zoom? Yeah, so I just want to say, um, you know, for so many years in my life, I felt lost as a person. I felt like I didn't have a purpose. I didn't have a mission. I was always trying to figure it, figure it out. And um, I was a flight attendant manager at Virgin, busted my eardrum one day at work, game over, basically. I was grounded, wasn't allowed to fly for a job anymore. And I was so super lucky. Um, Pat Thomas, a lady down in Adelaide, a friend of mine's mum was running a home care program. And she said, why don't you give home care a go? I packed up and moved my life down to Adelaide. And within 18 months, I've done three different courses, moved up the ranks and sort of fell into this industry. And what an absolute blessing it's been because 11 years later, I've gone through working for profit companies, not for profits, seen the good, the bad, the ugly, and have realized what it is that needs to change. And so set together, we care up. A number of years ago and it's just it's just been a wild and absolutely amazing ride um, and I just can't wait to to continue growing and expanding this um, organization so that people can get really decent quality care because that's what's important. So good thank you so much Jay. Folks I will get Jay back in uh, three to six months time find out where Together We Care is, find out how much it's grown. We'll have some more wonderful stories, no doubt. So thanks very much for tuning in to the Fair Business Australia podcast. If you're a small business owner and you are community focused and really want to share and care with your local community and would love to be on this podcast, please do reach out to me. I would love to hear from you. I would love to connect you with people. That is my superpower is connectivity. Thanks once again, and we'll see you on the next Zoom. Have you got a great business or community initiative you'd like to share with our podcast audience? We'd love to hear from you. Reach out to us today at fairbusinessaustralia.com.au.